So anybody, shall we, shall we work? Uh, okay, you okay with that? See, now that's passive aggressive, Miss Dent. Either say yes or ask the next question. Well, when you talked about the crisis response team, it was all sorts of crises, and I guess because my team only, there had to be a death, or there had to be a murder. Yeah. And so, so my show was going to be all was like that, but I'm, you know, trying to think now if maybe I should expand it the way you did to other crimes and rapes. But there had to be a death if we got there, and it seemed like it was a natural. So, crisis. so what, what's your, what, what, what's your feeling about that? Um, I like violent deaths. I'm, I'm happy. God help me so much. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have enough to pick from after two years. So? So, um, I mean, do you think it widens the, you know, scope and gives more opportunity for the characters to, you know, be of interest or delve into different areas? You would want to feel your way into that and see, but I certainly, you know, violent violent death always makes it for me but I mean <laughs> there was a guy uh, this, uh, what I'm going to uh, trying to suggest to you is that these are false distinctions uh, a guy named uh, Iris Blount uh, a murderer uh, a serial murderer in New York but he'd rape him first and sometimes if he was interrupted before he got to the part where he skinned them and then killed them, it would just be a rape. Uh, suppose you were to do a story where the crisis murder team, the woman is so convinced that the manner of his forced entry into the apartment is so similar to Iris Blount's modus operandi that she's the one who comes to the Irish cop and says, that's Iris Blount. See how if you, if you fold it back into the, into the premise, you know, it, it widens out and what seems to be different, in fact, turns out to be the same. And then, you know, and based on that, you know, she says, I want to work on, can't, can't the crisis team, you know, work on more than just murder? And then you run into all sorts of bureaucratic, well, that isn't uh, the authorization from the city council, says the crisis team is just murder. They said, well, someone didn't tell Iris Blount. Well, what just happened? Before this, was there had someone suggested another uh, another thing there? Who was on the phone? That's right. <laughs> My apologies, Mr. Fedor. No, I'm not asking for that. I want to know who was on the phone. My mom. How was that? <laughs> The God's truth, she's pissed that I didn't bring her a bowl of ice cream before I left. <laughs> I guess the next question is, does she live out of town? Because that would be quite a journey. <laughs> I journeyed in today. I drove in from San Bernardino. God You're that important. You. God love you. Now you take a lot of crack because I know San Bernardino. <laughs> You know, it's not crack. It's uh, what's 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 really happy out there is meth. Right. Yeah. There is a difference. Crack is cocaine. Meth is is you can cook it up. Uh, you can cook it up and. You can explain to me what <laughs> meth is. <laughs> um, what do you what do you think of what do you think of this thing in San Bernardino? You know where there are all of those uh, uh, things about the child rape and everything. Where you know that the case I'm talking about, twenty five. Vaguely. They, a lot of people spend a lot of years in jail, you know, about that, where they where uh, you know, they were accused and then it turned out that the the workers were encouraging the kids, you know, and all that stuff. That it's it, that's well, a great way to say that San Bernardino cops entrap people? Oh God forbid. Uh that uh go back and read uh the crucible which is about the Salem witch trials. I've taught the Crucible, sir, in high school. Well, go back and read it before you. 
you know, it might, it might be an interesting parallel, you know, collective madness. And, and uh, it usually, in, in an hysterical environment, it usually focuses, the, the collective madness usually focuses on, you know, some sort of taboo. That, that's where the devil is. So she lives in San Bernardino? Uh, yeah, she's disabled and I take care of her there, yeah. God bless you. And, and uh, uh, does she live in the house, if I may ask? Or, or, or yeah, yeah, she's, she's uh, got her, yeah. What's her face? She's got an apartment there? No, 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 she's got a house. It, and you live in the same house? Correct. Yeah, and so, and uh, what's your favorite kind of ice cream? Hers or mine? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. She likes anything chocolate. Yeah. Is there like chocolate swirl? Or? Um, lately, Rocky Road. Rocky Road. Now, is this a, is it, how long, is this just a flirtation or do you think she's going there? <laughs> uh, she goes through food fads yeah. for a few months and then it's on to something else. She's what was the one before pecan, Rocky but Road? Rich. Butter pecan, but now butter pecan is too rich. Butter pecan, the young man is not chocolate. I know. So you may be a little unfair to her in saying she's a chocolate fanatic. Well, she is now. Can we generalize the like, sweets? She has a sweet tooth. Sure. Is she diabetic? Yes. A lot of times diabetics crave sweets. That's why, that's why I asked. Is she having circulatory problems? Yes. Is that part of why she's bedridden? Yes. And uh, how's her eyesight? Not too good. Yeah, that's, that's another complication. Diabetes. So, uh, do you do you see if if you're still and trying to relate to your brother or sister, uh, and not a, 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 that this too it could be the premise of a story or a series if you if you follow it out. Uh, and typically, you know, uh, someone who has been so generous uh, as to care for, you know, a suffering parent. Uh, if you'll permit me to talk a little bit more about it, in in dwells with a kind of chronic sense of it's not enough. Whatever I do isn't enough, and that tends to spill over. So when I ask who is on the phone, what's your name, sir? Uh, Mike. Mike. Mike's impulse was to apologize uh, for an intrusion rather than to respond to the question. And in the gap between, as I explored the gap between, when I said, I, I, I didn't ask for that, I want to know who's on the phone. Although uh, I, I, the affect in my voice was kind of working class as a way of distracting him from the possibility that I was pursuing an imaginative goal, which was to reassure him uh, and, and to suggest that reassurance can be offered, you know, even from a seemingly unfeeling position. And that any life situation, uh, if you follow it out, you know, Emily Dickinson uh, lived a life as circumscribed as Mike's mom. Uh, and in great poetry, uh, if you stay with the details of how it is in, in a life which seems for example, to be so repetitive, uh, to be to be so uh, hemmed in. You can even find variety in a slow weaning from butter pecan and a transfer of allegiance to Rocky Road. And uh, the job of the artist is to train his expectation or hers 
to see at the level of detail and focus that illuminates the fact that Mike's mom, too, is resting transparently, you know, in the spirit which gave her rise. And part of what, what helps her rest more comfortably is Mike. That's a tough thing to accept, and sometimes, you know, guilt uh, is one of the masks that love wears. And that's the job also of the artist to show. Is there a series of wanting to kill your mother? <laughs> there's not only a series, there's a series of series. Uh, sure, you know, um, uh, Oedipus is a long-running, uh, excuse me? Forgive me, I might. Stewie and Family Guy? Yeah, I never saw Family um, Guy, but does he want to kill mom? The whole thing is, he's, he's basically a baby who's lost his yeah. mother every day of his life. Yeah, and, and the, uh, uh, you know, wanting, wanting to kill your mom is, is at some level a version of, that's who I have to love? Uh, and a lot of times the answer is yes. And sometimes the thought is, I'm never going to be able to love anybody else until I get rid of her. Uh, and sometimes the ostensible impulse to murder is a way of saying, I just wish I was brave enough to go to the social at church on Thursday night. But I'm afraid to do that and because I'm afraid to do that, I want to kill her. Again, this is simply a widening out of associations so that any, if, if you stay with any premise, you know, and, and try, to, try to identify its cousins, the genealogy of the, in the family of the association, you, you, you may find that, uh, you know, it's, it's fertile ground for storytelling everywhere. And the idea of trying to posit in the expectations of the other, the only acceptable for for a story, the only acceptable premise for a story, oh, it's got to be X or it's got to be Y, that's that's just an exercise in fear. And you just need to stay with it. Uh, you know, someone who wants to kill his mother. Uh, did you ever see Harold and Maud? That's like a cousin of that. You know, a kid who wants to kill himself. And, and, that's, and, there, and there's a dominating maternal presence. The only thing is she's not really his mother, and he realizes he loves her. Come on, come on, come on. I, I'm giving away a, a, a million dollars worth of... Uh, I got one. Um, I'm working on a, uh, developing a show called The Church of Sharing. I, uh, I grew the up Church in, of Sharing. S H A R I N G. Yeah, I grew up in uh, Manhattan, in New York, in the '70s. And my parents, my father was a criminal, my mom was a bookie, and both of my brothers were heroin addicts and dealers. And uh, at the age of 16, I went on my own, and I worked at this club in New York, uh, which was called Midnight Interlude. And uh, Dan and Deborah were the owners of the club, and they had a naked talk show on Channel J. Yeah. <laughs> and it was right after Robin Bird. And um, so as a 16-year-old kid with no family, with this fucked up crazy, you know, I mean, craziness in my house, I wound up finding family in a fucking whorehouse because they had a swingers club that they hired girls to act as uh, swingers because the ratio from male to female was like 25 to 1. And we had like four or five couples swinging. And then I, I, I was promoted from like the buffet to coat check to head pimp at 17. <laughs> but I was, what I did was I was the guy who wrote the checks to the girls at the end of the night. And we had this room called the uh, swing room. We had a card called the IBM card, the Intercourse Blowjob Masturbation card. And we had to check off what everybody did. And then the girls got paid accordingly. Long story short is we got shut down, got busted. <laughs> but we when? reopened as the church of sharing. He was a really smart businessman because who was well, the guy? His name was Dan Wagner. And he reopened it as the Church of Sharing, and all we had to do was sign these documents to say that we were Brother Lennon or Sister So-and-So, and you made a donation, and it was a whorehouse. 
Mm-hmm. So in it's Manhattan. in Manhattan on 76th and 3rd, it was a Bub Ray's Pizza. It was a brownstone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What was the uh, 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 the connection with Plato's Retreat? They were like they were like sister uh, companies, you know. It was like Xenon and Studio 54, you know. Uh, it was the just the, the uh, other side of the, the other guy side. who founded uh, Plato's Retreat. Uh, no longer with us, uh, but the a reporter who fixated on this guy uh, uh, approached me to to write about. That'd be great. Uh, well, uh, but maybe you're the guy. Uh, the uh, uh, this guy who started Plato's Retreat um, had boundary issues. Imagine. And uh, so, and he he was proud to uh, state that he had had uh, intercourse with thirty thousand women, and uh, he w- professed himself to have been a patsy for the mob, that the mob was using Plato's retreat to launder money and so on, and they made it what's called a bust out joint. You know what that is, where. You never pay your taxes or anything, and then when they come to collar you, you need you you leave one victim, and then everybody you know in whose name the license is and so on. So this was this guy. He was the victim, and uh, he did eight years, and then he came out, and by then the party was pretty much over. So. Uh, and and he he died he he, he weighed about four seventy five when he died, so th- there again there was another sort of boundary issue you know. And this reporter told me that once this guy had proposed to a girl and uh, she turned him down I can't imagine why. And the reporter sat with him in uh, the there's a restaurant uh, in the Chelsea Hotel is it El, El Quixote, yeah, and this guy ate thirty six lobsters. Good. See you, Mike. What's what's your friend's name? This is this is Evan. Hey, Evan. Are you from San Bernardino? No, no, no such luck. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I say to uh, I say to the reporter, who's still alive and who is cherishing this fellow's memory, you know, I say eight eight years. You know, uh, was that a tough bit for him to do? He said, well, he never spoke of it with, uh, you know, any particular bitterness or something. In fact, he died. He was a very sweet guy. I say, you don't think he might have been getting hit in the seat, do you? In jail? Because, you know, a guy who sleeps with 30,000 humans isn't necessarily fastidious about gender difference, right? He says, you know, I never, uh, I never thought of that. Although, now that you say it, everybody I uh, used to say that at Plato's retreat uh, in the orgies, he would always go down on all the drag queens. Uh, so the... the uh, now, what are we to infer from this environment? Uh, that uh, uh, the predisposition to transfer dysfunction from one environment to another. That, you know, if one person's a bookmaker and someone else, what, what was dad? What, what kind? He robbed banks, he, uh, he was up for murder. He died when I was five. He was up for murder. What, what, what did, was he elected? They say he did. I don't know. I didn't know him well. My parents both died by the time I was 11. Your parents both died? Yeah. And uh, uh, clearly, the, uh, uh, you know, people who transgress one boundary are more disposed to transgress others. It wouldn't surprise me if there, some of that was going on as well. And... Uh, the reenactment later in life 
of that kind of transgression, you know, would be an absolutely understandable sort of uh, thing. In, in this guy's case, uh, it's almost, you know, it's ridiculous. His, his dad was a meat packer. <laughs> a wholesale meat packer. Uh, and uh, his mother was very involved with the young man. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there, there's, there is a poetry in what is painfully apparent if, if you just still, you know, and let people talk. Uh, and this, the, to me, the interesting guy in the story was the reporter. Uh, who's a kid who uh, the, the the other the, this this guy who ran Plato's retreat's been dead for twelve years, and the reporter has stayed true to his memory. What does that mean? Uh, and the fact that it would take me to suggest a complication in the founder of Plato's retreat uh, in, in, in his uh, behavior that had not occurred to the reporter um, is, begins to shape the story. And the reason it begins to shape the story is not under the category of tawdry revelation, but uh, what extraordinary and various creatures we are, and with what tenacity we try to live. And this kid, uh, in the aftermath of the death of his great buddy there, is now a freak for insult comics. Hangs around with insult comics all the time. And they, too, have a curious and convoluted way of indicting the past. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I think I told you once that Good Ed said, you know, he'd never heard of a crime he couldn't commit. Uh, and uh, me neither. And, and so the taboo that's associated with, say, you know, polymorphous perversity or any of that stuff is, is an utter irrelevancy. You know, the goal is to show how even that gentleman, tipping the scales at 475, viewed properly, can be seen to be resting transparently in the spirit which created him. That's, that's the process of art. So, you know, I'd say have Adam. And, uh, you know, we can talk a little bit afterwards. And, and uh, there's an extraordinary actor attached to that project. Extraordinary. But, uh, you know, I, I'm involved with other things. Yes.